Phoenix Suns all-world point guard Chris Paul has entered the COVID protocol in the NBA, and he is out an indefinite amount of time. The coronavirus. Oh, indeed. According to uh, Shams, Phoenix Suns All-NBA guard Chris Paul has entered COVID-19 health and safety protocols and is sidelined for an indefinite period of time. Sources tell The Athletic. Dude, what are we doing? I don't know. What are Um, we doing? This is a massive story. Um, Now, if you are Chris Paul, are you not calling Mike Conley and thanking him for refusing to play while injured? This is very frustrating out of Chris Paul. Um, you know, I, I, I would be shocked if Chris Paul was the guy who was going out, you know, clubbing certainly, but it's, uh, how does this, every time this happens, I'm just like, dude, like, how do you allow this to happen? You're in the postseason. How do you allow COVID to sideline you? How does that happen, dude? And the reason, the reason, you know, I, I have this mentality towards it for professional athletes is because they have structure and protections in place to make sure that they have zero yeah. chance of exposure. You know, th- th- like it, this is not difficult. This is, this is, I'd even go as far as to say, this is a mistake out of Chris Paul, somebody somewhere in the Phoenix Suns organization, uh, somewhere in the line allowed COVID to break, to break the, you know, the, the circle, if you will, yeah. because everybody in the NBA is, for the most part, is is vaccinated. So for this to happen, he would have had to spend time around somebody who who had coronavirus. Yeah, it's unbelievable to me. This is a shocking development. And again, if you're just tuning in, uh, All NBA guard Chris Paul of the Phoenix Suns has been placed in the COVID nineteen protocols for the NBA, and there is no timetable for his return or eligibility to return to the team. He will not practice. He cannot be around the club. He can't be at their practice facility. He cannot be anywhere near the Phoenix Suns at this moment. There is no word on how Chris Paul may have been or if he was, in fact, exposed to the coronavirus. Um, This is just a shocking turn of events. And, again, we don't know the schedule for the Western Conference Finals, but there is no doubt now that Chris Paul is in jeopardy of missing um, the first game or two of that series. I mean, if you push this out 10 days, you certainly are in the window to start the the Western Conference Finals. This is a shocking development. I mean, they're yeah. not the same team without Chris Paul. Not even close. I, I mean, his impact is is massive for them in a, in, in a variety of different ways. I mean, yes, you know, in, in the elimination game uh, in Denver the other day, yeah, he gave you 37 or whatever, but at the end of the day, you know, the, his his impact is is massive. I mean, you're, you're talking about a guy who distributes. You're talking about a guy who sets the tone for this team. You're talking about a guy who allows Devin Booker to actually get space and score. You know, I mean, it's it's a big deal. And that's why, you know, to me, it's just it, it's frustrating as hell because there's no reason for Chris Paul to be in the COVID protocol. There, It should never have happened. And, and, and all that means is, is is it was probably a a family member or or it, it was I guarantee you it was a situation where everyone was like oh everything's cool right this part we're like we're all good we're not in any at any risk here we're good to go you know it's not like he chose to get coronavirus but the problem is is that I, I'm sure that he was not he or the people around him in his circle were not diligent enough about protecting him. And this is what happens. I mean, this is potentially, again, hot take guy, right? But this is potentially, if he were to miss the first, let's say, two games of the Western Conference Finals against either this Jazz or Clippers team, whatever it ends up being, I mean, you're talking about potentially losing out on, on your last opportunity to make a Finals appearance because you got COVID. I mean, that's horrible. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, and I don't, I don't know what you do. I can't. Eat, I, this has this in my mind. I agree with you 100. percent This has to be something outside of the Suns circle. This has to. And you saw him go into the stands, hugging his parents. Like, yeah. To me, it feels like, hey, some friends and family. You know, some folks came to the house. Maybe it was Jake from State Farm. I mean, uh, I don't hey. know. 
or yeah, Cliff, so, do, or Cliff, do, Uncle Cliff from State Farm. I mean, you know. Uh, anyway, the point is, somewhere along the line, Chris Ball did something he shouldn't have done, and it is going to cost the Suns dearly. And you know what the problem here is? If you're the Phoenix Suns, everything was going perfect. Perfect. You had a week off. You have the Jazz and the Clippers battling tooth and nail. Um, you have an injured Brooklyn Nets team now extending their series with the Milwaukee Bucks. You have an injured Joel Embiid. Like, everything was perfect. And now, all of a sudden, arguably your most important player is not potentially going to be available to you. I, I, I just cannot even it's fathom. It's the worst of the worst. I can't even it's fathom. It's the worst of the worst, dude. I, I just, I, it's amazing. Um, Driftwood says, fake news. He will test negative by the end of the week. Yeah, we'll um, see. Well, yeah, that might be true. I don't think it's fake news at all. I think it is shocking. Um, this, and by the way, for all of you, there's a couple of people talking about fit, false positives. The he, you are not tested once and put in the protocol. Um, you are tested. You fail. You are tested again, and then you are tested a third time. So it is very difficult to get placed in the protocol. It's not something that happens after one positive for test. good reason. And my guess is. My guess is, yeah. is this was not even a positive test. My guess is this was a breach in decorum. This was something Chris Paul did or was close to somebody who tested positive. Do you remember Kevin Durant being pulled off the bench for the Nets because his barber, um, or, or uh, he wasn't wearing a mask in a car? Like, yeah. That's what this feels like to me. And there's no getting out of those protocols. There are minimums in place. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. This is absolutely crazy. Having said that, we will keep you up to date on that story as it gets updated. I'm sure as the day goes on, we will get details on that. But your guy, your boy, your man, Kevin Durant, lost his mind last night, Jake. I'm Kevin Durant. You know who I am. Look at Jake's face. Look how just... I mean, it's it's incredible, you I know. Mean, My guy coming through, forty nine, seventeen, and ten. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what else I can say. I mean, the numbers, as usual, speak for themselves. So, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, people already on Twitter last night were like, "Hey, tomorrow's show is going to be the slurpification of Kevin Durant," and all I have to say is, "You're damn right it is. You're damn right because James Harden was out there on one leg." Uh, doing the best that he could possibly do, which I give him huge respect for. Uh, clearly, very much hurt. Um, and I give Jeff Green a lot of credit too, man. I mean, 27 points. Uh, I think it was 7-8 from three. Like, the guy balled out, you know, and, and they found a way to win that game. And all I'm saying is is I think that the that Kevin Durant um, did what superstars do from time to time, and he did not leave it in the hands of the officials. He didn't leave it in the hands of – of the Milwaukee Bucks and Giannis, uh, he left it in his hands, and he knocked down a bunch of shots and willed them to victory. Now, can he? I, 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 is it going to take that level of performance again in, in Game Six? I don't know, man. I, I because certainly you're not you're not doing this on a night in and night out basis. That was definitely a one off. You know, hey, we need you tonight, kind of game. So we'll see. We'll see what the next game looks like. But um, I, it's a huge victory for them. Uh, they've now got some breathing space. They're up three two. So you got two games to win one. You're you're in a great spot. Yeah. Well, the Bucks are still going to win the series. No, the Bucks are not going to win the series. Is Kevin Durant the best player in the world right now? Not going. Not currently playing. The best basketball player in the world. I have to say yes. And I think he is. And I've seen a lot of Kobe and Jordan. Kevin Durant reminds me a heck of a lot of Michael Jordan. Um, he's got that killer instinct. He's got that want to to damage you and end you, and he wants to do it himself, and he knows he needs to do it himself, and he went out and did it himself. And we've talked a lot about hero ball on this show the last couple of weeks, it feels like. That's playing hero ball because they need you to. There's no other option. It's Kevin Durant. And the best part about last night, to me, was that the NBA and I, I think pretty much universally everybody around, you know, the Twitterverse and the in the media, world. the sporting world 
recognized how special that performance was, and I think that's really, really critical. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, while we're talking about, you know, Katie's performance, I think it, it's important for us to to kind of distinguish the difference between, you know, Donovan Mitchell and what he's doing in terms, you know, because we talked a lot about Donovan playing hero ball and, and, and what Kevin did last night. And I think, I think last night, you know, I said this before the show. I, I think the best way to describe what, what this conversation is is there are levels – to the hero ball game. Some guys play hero ball, and that looks like them taking a bunch of shots, missing some shots, and not really helping their team win, right? Other guys play hero ball, and they give you, most times it's not 50. Most times it's like 35, but you're going to get like, you know, 15 assists out of them, and you're going to get, you know, the 10 to 12 boards out of them. Kevin Durant happens to be a gifted scorer, so he was able to get to that 49-point number. Most guys, it's like 35, 10, and 10. So right. last night, to me, the difference was is that Kevin Durant was not only on a mission to score a lot of points and carry his team, but he was really on a mission to facilitate. And that was one of my biggest concerns about him as a player going into this game yesterday. To me, Kevin Durant is not known as a facilitator. He's not known as the guy that is going to play a great team game. He is the guy that you give the ball to and you say, hey, we need 20 out of you in the fourth quarter. Go and get it for us. That's that's what you know Kevin Durant for. So I was actually impressed with him last night being able to facilitate and rebound as much as he did. I thought that's really the better part of the performance. Well, and I thought the, the most impressive thing was James Harden. I mean – Outside of Kevin Durant just continually going to the rack and putting it in the hole, nothing. You wow. Um, wow. Anyway, wow. the point is, if you felt these balls, the point is, <laughs> um, I think James Harden being a one hundred percent distraction for the Milwaukee Bucks was remarkable, and he, I think he had one field goal in the entire game, and I look at the fact that. Holiday was in his shorts, yeah. and I think James Harden loved it because he knew he wasn't capable of going to the basket. He knew that all of his energy was going to be spent on the defensive end. I think James Harden was a real important figure in that game last night, even though he didn't score a whole bunch. Yeah, and I, and I thought his defense on that last play against Giannis where, where he forces ESPN or uh, the broadcast or whatever did – TNT. TNT did – uh, they did a breakdown of it, uh, of him playing individual defense on the block against Giannis. And James Harden is literally rejecting the double the double team, the help. No, 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 my friend. What I'm telling you is Giannis was rejecting the screen to get to the basket. And the amazing part of that was, is he rejected a screen to take a turnaround Fade away, about fifteen foot jumper that he had no chance to make. Mm. It was ridiculous uh-huh. that Giannis took that shot. When you have an injured James Harden who is on one leg that you've dominated, running to the basket on no matter who they put on you, you took a fifteen foot turnaround fadeaway jumper that the elite shooters in the NBA struggle to make. Mm. Giannis was never going to make that shot. Right. Never going to make that shot. And as far as Harden's defense goes, I think he did everything he could do, jump it off of one leg. Yeah. I, I, I thought That's it, what I'm saying. I'm trying to give the guy credit here. I'm, I'm yeah. saying that he played great defense when they needed it most. And, yes, your point about him being a distraction, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he, he understood, uh, and I think the team understood, that obviously he wasn't 100% and he wasn't going to give you a typical James Harden level performance. And we saw six minutes. Yeah, dude. And and this is why, like, I know Mike Conley's not James Harden, but at what point does Mike Conley play, dude? Like I'm looking at, I'm looking at Mike Conley. uh, I'm looking at all these other guys who are playing injured. And I'm just sitting here saying like, dude, like at what point does Mike Conley get on the floor? Like if you're not going to play, just rule him out the rest of the series. You know, the the Jazz need Mike Conley if they want to win this series. It's that simple. So I'm watching this game last night, and, and I'm like, man, like Mike Conley could probably do this. Mike Conley doesn't need to score a whole heck of a lot. Uh, Mike Conley needs to be a facilitator. That's all they need him to do. And yet he's not playing. And 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 so watching this game, I'm like, dude, like at some point, Conley's got to get back on the floor, even if he's 70%. Get him on the floor. Is it fair 
to compare Mike Conley and James Harden. I'm comparing the situations. I'm not comparing them as I don't think it's direct. fair. Okay. I, I know they're both dealing with hamstrings, but we have no no idea the degree of Mike Conley's hamstring injury. It's been 14 days. It's been two weeks today since he played. If he's got a hamstring injury, and it's probably a grade two, I, I, I mean, 14 days is just not enough time to recover. My guess is that he does not play tonight, um, even though I think he should. I, I, I would really hope that he, he would play even if he can't contribute much offensively, I mean, James Harden, arguably the best three-point shooter in the in the NBA, goes 0 for 8 from 3 last night. But but as we just said, he was a distraction. Holiday guarded him very closely. And so I think there is value in Mike being on the floor, but he's not nearly di- the dynamic presence that James Harden is. Um, and my feeling is, is that I, I just... I think you have a lot more cushion here if you're the Utah Jazz than the Brooklyn Nets do. Man, I yeah. And, and I think this is where we, we begin to disagree because I don't think that Clippers defense is going anywhere. I, I think that they've figured out how to slow the Jazz down, and the Jazz don't particularly have an answer for, hey, what are, what are we doing with Kawhi at the free throw line in awkward one-on-one matchups? They, they haven't shown an answer for that, and I don't know that any team would have an answer for that. You know, if he's knocking that down, what are you going to do about it? There's not much to do about it other than your your only option really is to double him and see if he can move the ball. But then you're you're talking about giving up a wide open three to Morris in the corner who's been on fire. So that's why I say I don't – I'm yeah. not certainly sitting here saying that tonight the Clippers should be favored at the Viv. I'm not saying they should be favored. But what I am telling you is this should not be a thing where we go into this game thinking the Jazz are going to win this by like – five to seven points because at the end of the day they're going to make some extra shots that they didn't make in LA but the defense is going to be there so the question is what's the answer like what are they going to do that they haven't been able to do in the last two games well to be clear the Jazz are favored by two and a half uh at home and the number's 222 how do you not take the Jazz in the over I mean if you're a betting man I that if you're going to lay down money which here in the great state of Utah is illegal uh, but if you're going to lay down money, I would tell you get all over the Jazz in the two and a half in the over. I, d- I don't know how you don't bet that. There's a lot of people uh, talking about COVID this morning uh, which with the Chris Paul thing. Eric C. says Jake has the most punchable face on YouTube. That could be. Um, Great. Cody Strickland says, Jake, tell me the truth. How many times did you get your Jolly Rogers off during KD's performance last night? Be honest. <laughs> yeah, it was, dude, it was incredible. <laughs> Don't ever play that sound. It was again. incredible. Spencer Morgan says, let CP play. This is ridiculous. What's ridiculous? I mean, that he broke pro- COVID protocols? I mean, you're talking about protecting a billion-dollar industry, and you should risk a billion-dollar industry for Chris Paul. I no. don't think so. No. Um, Eric C. says, let me see how much that depth of the Suns lasts. True. Um, good morning, y'all. Game day. Go Jazz. Napo Cardona says. Brandon Whiteside says, did you say James Harden um, like Holiday in his pants and that Harden liked it? Carry on. I did say that. Um, you know. <laughs> you know. So far, Brandon says, the best way to destroy the Jazz is to put players into the hands of the Jazz medical staff. Okay, well, the Jazz medical staff, their job is not to make sure players are on the floor. Their job is to make sure that the players on the floor are capable of being on the floor. Mm. And this obviously goes back to the the Donovan yeah. Mitchell shot in game one. Like, why would the Jazz medical staff tr- hold out Donovan Mitchell if they, you know, if they thought he could play? Why would they do that? I, I that to me, and this is always this has been the conversation we've had about this Donovan Mitchell situation and every other situation, including Mike Conley. And that is that it, it just it does the Utah Jazz medical staff no good to hold a guy out any longer than they need to hold him out. Like, what's the upside for the medical staff there? Yeah, taking public ridicule and you know being accused and, and I mean, there's no upside there. They're not trying to keep Mike Conley out of the lineup. Right. I mean, there's again, there's no there there to keep Mike Conley out of the lineup. There just is no there's no win for them. You know, like I. Yeah. I think tonight, if you're the Utah Jazz, you have to take some lessons from that Nets win. And that is that, you know, unfortunately, 
And I don't know that Donovan Mitchell's capable of it. I could be wrong. But I think you have to give Donovan Mitchell the basketball and just turn him loose. And it's unfortunate because I, I, I certainly don't think Donovan Mitchell's on Kevin Durant's ability level. Um, he's not making the shots that Kevin Durant made. Um, he's also not seven foot, foot tall. By I the way. was going to say that's the main that's the major difference that allows Kevin Durant to get to his spots is his height and his frame. You know, and that's you can't you can't uh, you can't teach obviously build and frame and size. Right. You know, right. so like you know, Don is an amazing individual scorer and he is a killer and he wants to do those things to you. But, you know, the reason that Kevin Durant's able to just rise up and hit that late three on the wing, you know, when Harden's holding the ball for a gazillion seconds is because he's seven foot tall and, and the defender can't contest. So, yeah, it's a tough situation. But, you know, my question for the Nets is how much energy did they use last night? A ton. An absolute ton. And and, and I think moving forward, it's going to be a huge question. You know, I mean, again, you've got two games to win one. So you you like those chances. But at the same time... You know, you that that was definitely like a, you know, give it all we have to win this game. Not sure what tomorrow looks like kind of deal. Well, I, I mean, the, uh, Reggie Miller from TNT took a ton of heat on Twitter last night because he suggested that the Brooklyn Nets sit Kevin Durant and James Harden for game six in Milwaukee and go all in on game seven because you have Durant playing Full 48 minutes, did not miss a second yeah. of the game. He was on the floor for every second of the game last night. Mm -hmm. James Harden on one leg played 46 minutes. Having said that, hell no, you're not doing that. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a game where superstars are minted in these kind of situations, and I think James Harden will adjust. He clearly was not 60% of himself. Um, he had no lift or rise for the jumper. I mean, that hamstring is clearly a larger issue than, you know, that was described, and you understand that. But I don't think there's any way, Jake, that you sit James Harden and Kevin Durant for game six. Yeah, I just think it's 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 a gimmick. Like, it's it, it, logically speaking, you just not, uh, it, it, you're just assuming that they'd be okay with losing game six, you know, that that, that you would be cool to, to put everything on the line for a game seven. And, and I just don't think that that's smart basketball. I mean, I, I, I think you have a, a, a head coach in Steve Nash, who's incredibly savvy, mainly because he's one of the best point guards that's ever played the game. So he understands how to get into certain situations to take advantage of certain skill sets. And he understands how to take his players and put them in those positions to, to create an advantageous situation. So I think for the Nets, it's like, okay, yes, we played a lot of minutes. That doesn't mean we got to sit these two guys. Is there going to be some minute management? Sure, maybe. May, you know, maybe we're not going to get them into the upper 30s, but you can't tell me you don't want you know 25 or 30 out of Durant in 25 minutes because he can absolutely do that, as we saw last night. So the question really has nothing to do with James Harden and Kevin Durant. The question really is, can Jeff Green give you 25 again? Can Mike James give you something other than, you know, very little in the scoring department? Because he does a lot for you on the floor. He just hasn't been scoring too much, to be honest with you. And lastly, can Landry Shamet continue to knock down the three? Because if he can do that, they're going to be in fine, fine shape. So those are the questions that I look for with the Nets. And then I, I take that Nets situation and those same questions and I apply it to the Utah Jazz in this game tonight, and I say, okay, can we get 50% from three tonight? Are the Clippers going to play that that same aggressive style of defense that we've seen? Yes, I, th I think they will. I think that's just a foregone conclusion. So really what's going to decide this game is, can the Utah Jazz get into the paint and move the ball? If they get into the paint and they're swinging the ball, they're going to win this game You know, pretty comfortably, I would think. But they haven't shown the ability to do that recently. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I see. I'm trying not to be frustrated with the Jazz. Yeah, well, you and everybody else, you know, seriously. I, I need, I want, uh, I hope that Mike Conley plays tonight, and I hope that we get into a situation where the Jazz have a laugher tonight. The Jazz need to win by 15, 17, 20 points. They need to feel good again. You know what I mean? Like they, I mean, they, they need yeah, that. Yeah, got to get your swagger back. I think they're, they're fully capable of doing that. But 
I don't know that they believe they're that team anymore. Why do you say? Because I don't think you can play George Niang in this series. I, I, mm. I, don't, I don't think that you can just keep doing the same things that you did all season long. Mm-hmm. But I also think they realize they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. You know, like the, the Brooklyn Nets have, I mean, not arguably, they have the best coaching staff in basketball. It's crazy. And you're seeing them make quarter to quarter, minute to minute adjustments. Yeah. Where they're moving guys, and you figure out that Landry Shamit last night has to play because he's the guy that can break the paint and hit a jump shot. And he did that. He definitely did that. And it opened up more space for James Harden so that James Harden wasn't, you know, checked by Holiday real tight all the time. Now, he didn't make a shot. Went 0 for 8 from 3, but you're starting to see that the Jazz don't have that ability. They don't have, and really in particular, Quinn Snyder doesn't have the flexibility because of the way this roster is constructed to do those things. You're really relying on Mike Conley to come back and play so that Joe Ingles can come off the bench with Jordan Clarkson. Because the other guy I think that is shockingly really struggled at times in this series is Derek Favors. Like, they are attacking Derek Favors. If the dunk by Kawhi Leonard didn't show you that, (laughs) they have continually gone into the paint and attacked Derek Favors. The rack attack! Yeah, and what they're also doing is they are not attacking Rudy Gobert in the paint. They're simply drawing him out so that he's playing Kawhi Leonard at the three-point stripe. So that he's playing Paul George at the three-point stripe. Yeah. And then they're just driving right around him. And they're either getting fouled or they're making a layup. What are the Jazz going to do about that? And my my simple answer to that is, I don't think you have an answer. I don't think there is an adjustment to be made there because you're so limited in the, in uh, on this roster. Yeah. And George Niang, frankly, is a really nice story. Right? He, he's a guy that... Iowa State Cyclones, and that's all well and good. But if you're not going to make threes, you can't play for us in this series because you're a defensive liability. Mm -hmm. And frankly, your ability to get into the paint is a little underrated, but it doesn't outweigh the fact that you look scared and you can't make a three-point shot. And they're, again, attacking you defensively. I just don't see how you play Derek Favors more than 10 minutes. Yeah. You need to rest Rudy, but frankly, Rudy's got to play 40 minutes in this series. Yeah, he does, and, and, and that's why I say I think it comes down to, um, I, for the Jazz, I, I don't even think that it has anything to do with the defensive end, because like you were just saying, they don't really have an answer for some of these situations that they find themselves in. I legitimately think this series will be decided by the Jazz ability to, on offense for the Jazz, their ability to drive the paint, kick the ball, and swing the ball. If they do that and they make that three, they will win the series. But again, the the Clippers are not allowing them, for the most part, we do see it, but for the most part, they've limited the Jazz ability to get, to get into the paint and start that process. And that's why I say, typically against almost any other team, that they like if they were playing the Nuggets, I would say, yeah, they got this series. It's good. We don't have to worry. But what concerns me so much is that the, the Clippers have – so much athleticism on defense that you're not even able to get to the paint to make the pass. You can't knock down the three if you can't make the pass. Well, and I think your point is the Clippers' ability to limit the Jazz in doing just about anything the Jazz want to do. And they're not used to that, by the way. I think that also needs to be said. All season long, what have you had? You've had a situation where the Jazz can come into these games, and and what what have we come to know about this team? They're gonna they're gonna get out to a ten or fifteen point lead in the first ten minutes of the game. The the whoever they're playing is gonna reel them back in a little bit. It's gonna be close at the half. They're gonna put them away at the beginning of the third, and they cruise to the victory in the fourth. In this series, what have we seen? Every single game has started with an eight to two to twelve point run for either team. Yes, and then. Everything evens out, and the third quarter kind of decides it. The difference is is the Clippers are stout enough defensively to handle that, and they know it's coming. 
That's what concerns me. Uh, I, like, that's what majorly concerns me tonight. Well, this has been a series of runs. There, there's yeah. no doubt. I mean, when you see the Jazz go, was it, 3 of 17 the other night, 0 of 21 in the first game. Kawhi Leonard is not going to play tonight. Not surprising. Not surprising. Uh, more breaking news here on the show. Uh, Kawhi Leonard is expected to miss Game 5 against the Jazz tonight with a knee injury suffered in Game 4. Um, we talked about this yesterday. Well, and this changes everything now. I mean, now everything I just said doesn't count because they don't have one of their best defenders. So, yeah, I, I wonder, I wonder now, and the, and I think what the question that has to be asked is, if you're the LA Clippers, now what is your adjustment? Yeah. I, I, and I think it is you, you have to, you have to attack the paint and I think you got to go all in absolutely all in on on Kawhi Leonard coming back for game six at home. Yeah. And I think that this is kind of what you thought was going to happen. The war of attrition is real this year, man. Well, I, honestly, but, it's real. But why is that? Yeah, well, we know. Yeah. The off because, of the, because of the schedule, right? Yeah. I mean, I think you have a situation now where tonight, if you lose this game tonight, I'd be shocked. Um, you know, well, I, I, I just don't see how you would lose this game. To now, the yeah, I, I, now you shouldn't lose. I mean, now, now, you know, without Kawhi, now, now we're talking about not having it. Now you don't necessarily need Conley. Now it can truly be Don does his thing. You know, again, I still maintain that they need to get back to moving the ball because that's when they're at their best. But the no Kawhi thing, I mean, that's that that's a huge. That's a huge development. I, I mean, and, and the tweet also says that he's in doubt for the rest of the series. So that tells me that that's a pretty major, major thing he's got going on. So I don't think he's in doubt for the rest of the series. That would be, that'd be shocking. I mean, if he misses the rest of the series, you're talking about a meniscus injury yeah. or, well, you know, uh, it, I, I have real difficulty believing that he's in doubt for the rest of the series i'm just surprised he's not playing tonight i mean he was in the in the postgame presser he was all about not talking about that injury and just kind of well i mean i think that also tells you that you know he he's not going to he is he's not going to tell you that he's he's injured i mean that's not surprising man i don't um, know this is crazy bro i'm honestly i'm honestly sitting here like like i uh, this this now to me is one of those games that the Jazz should win, and and now I'm sitting here like, okay, the the series is going to end in six because uh, if you again if you don't have Kawhi, th th this totally changes the dynamic of what the Clippers do on defense. Well, let's talk about what this means for the Jazz. So what this means for the Jazz is you can afford to be much more aggressive offensively um, because Kawhi Leonard really was the guy that was making life difficult for Donovan Mitchell. Um, and you saw that that matchup zone that the Clippers were playing at the top of the, the arc especially uh, was really effective in keeping Donovan from shooting those threes. So I think now if you're Donovan Mitchell, now you have to get uber aggressive. The, and there's a, an upside and a downside. The upside is you're going to get into the paint a lot more because my guess is the Clippers are going to take away his three-point space a lot more. He's going to have to get into the paint. Well, with the ankle injury that Donovan's dealing with, every time he leaps to the basket, you're worried what's going to happen when he lands. Um, so there is some up and down in that. But I think what this also means is that you now have to use Rudy Gobert much more often on the pick and roll because Kawhi is very effective at taking that lob away from Rudy Gobert. And without Kawhi in the game or able to play, you really have to get more out of Rudy Gobert. That And what that tells me is that the Jazz also have a lot more room for error tonight. You can afford um, to see if Rudy can give you any offense if you throw him the ball in the post. And I don't mean back to the basket, you know, make a move. I mean, get in there, break the paint, kick to Rudy, let him try and dunk it, throw him lobs over the top. I think you have a lot more freedom to do that now. Um, if you are the Utah, Utah Jazz, excuse me, yeah, <clears throat> you have a lot more freedom to do that now. I think this just means you have to be a lot more aggressive offensively because you know their best defensive player is not going to be there. Yeah, and I think you got to look to put him away tonight in in, in Game Six. I, I, I think you know again we don't we don't know how long Kawhi is going to be out. We don't know if 
if it's just tonight or if it is indeed game six or the rest of the series. We, we just legitimately don't know. So if I'm the Jazz, I'm like, all right, this is our this is our opportunity. We can put this team away. We'll, we'll win tonight, and then we'll try to do it on the road in game six, and we'll be done, especially on the heels of the Chris Paul news. We don't know how long Chris Paul is going to be out. Um, it could be there are some people commenting that, you know, it, it could be a, a false positive or it could be any uh, it could be any number of situations for why he's actually in the protocol. You know, so until we know what that is, I think if you're the Jazz, you're you're trying to get out of the series as fast as possible. So, yeah, tonight I, I would expect them to be yeah uber aggressive offensively. Uh, tonight's definitely going to be another 53 point shots kind of game, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah, if they do what they usually do, they should be around 120 points. That's, yeah. that's what I would expect. Yeah, this is a shocking, shocking day of news in the NBA. And, again, if you're just tuning in, um, Chris Paul in the COVID protocols in the NBA, he is uh, in question now whether or not he'll be available to play uh, game one of the Western Conference Finals, no matter who gets there. I still maintain it's the Jazz. Um, Chris Paul is in COVID protocols. We don't know what that means or how that happened. We don't know if that means that he has COVID. We do not know if that means he was exposed to it. We don't know if he was vaccinated or not. So there's a lot of questions around his situation with COVID. Obviously, that's a that's a fluid situation. We'll keep you up to date on that. Brian Windhorst at ESPN is reporting that Kawhi Leonard will not play tonight dealing with that knee injury. You'll remember in the fourth quarter, he and uh, Joe Ingles collided uh, in the paint on the break, and Kawhi was out the last five minutes and 25 seconds of that game that the Clippers would eventually win, and now he is out. Now, Windhorst is also saying not only is Kawhi Leonard not playing tonight, but he is in doubt for the rest of the series. That is absolutely a game changer. Kawhi Leonard sat up on a podium after game four the other night and said, the only thing that matters to me is winning a championship. Yeah. And that means we've got two more games to win in this series. When he was asked about looking forward to the Western Conference Finals, he straight up said, all I care about is winning a championship. The next three games are all that matter. Yeah. Well, now it really is going to be you know game six and seven. Uh, if you are the Clippers, you got to find a way to win game six. If Kawhi doesn't play game six, the Jazz absolutely have to end this on Friday night in Los Angeles. You cannot afford in any way, shape, or form to lose tonight. This now, in my opinion, without Kawhi Leonard on the floor, becomes a must win for the Utah Jazz. Yeah. So a huge, huge break. If you are the Jazz without Kawhi Leonard in the lineup, you have to believe that you are going to win this game. And I, I think you have to believe that if you lose this game without Kawhi, you're in real trouble in this series. Yeah, and, and I think if you're the Clippers, I, I think also like I, I would think that you would you would want to play a physical game with the Jazz tonight. You know, you you would want to you would want to put Don's ankle to the test. You would want to you know really try to battle them uh, on that front because we've seen and we saw it, you know in this prior game that that Rudy can be had mentally to the point where he'll pick up a tech. You know, he'll he'll pick up that technical foul. You know, and you'll you'll get that momentum, but. I don't know. I, I just think that without without Kawhi on the floor, it's not only that you're losing his performance, you're also losing his veteran experience on the floor in those moments when you've got, you know, eighteen thousand raucous jazz fans, you know, screaming at the top of their lungs in, in the Viv and it's super loud and you need somebody out there who's a floor general. And you know, Paul George is not that guy. He is a second tier player and that's that's, right. that's that's a huge, huge deal. So yeah, I think um, I'm just honestly in shock. I mean, I, I can't believe um, we're sitting here talking about James Harden being hurt and Mike Conley being hurt. Now Kawhi's hurt. And like, you know, you've got Don's ankle. Like, well, all these guys are just breaking down. And I guess I'm not surprised, but it's just a real shame because I feel like these series could be just incredible basketball if, if health was not an issue, you know? Yeah, and I think this also tells you how difficult it is to play in the NBA. I mean, the beating that you take. And notice that all of these are leg injuries. I mean, you're talking about a knee for Kawhi. Uh, you're talking about hamstrings for Conley. And, uh, you know, you're talking about an ankle uh, for, you know, Kyrie Irving. You know, obviously James Harden's a hamstring. Like, it is a physical beating on your legs to play in the NBA. 
And to play 72 games in such a, a tight window and everybody says, oh, you're paid millions, get out there and play. Well, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, you had very little time off to recover. You look at guys like Anthony Davis who are, you know, they're dealing with quads and groins and, you know, LeBron Anthony James. Anthony Street-Close Davis. Yeah, LeBron James hurting that leg. Like, this is not just your, oh, they shut up and dribble, get out there and play. It is a great point that all these injuries are lower half injuries. Yeah. I mean, you're not yeah. looking at shoulders and, yeah, you know, I mean, it true. is, this is one of those situations where, you know, you, you, you have to build depth in this league now, especially in the, at the guard spot. I mean, you look at the way that teams are winning. You, you look at Kevin Durant last night. It's not that Kevin Durant was raining threes on the on the Milwaukee Bucks. He's dominating in the mid range. And you look at the way the Phoenix Suns got to the Western Conference Finals. It wasn't raining threes. It's dominating the mid range. Yeah. And you look at how Brooklyn is winning. It's dominating the mid range. Um, and that that's one of the things that I think the Jazz are really struggling with right now is is to to find a guy other than Donovan Mitchell that can dominate in the mid range, and it, and it's why, you know, your lack of depth at the guard position is really now your handicap at this point, because I think you know what Joe Ingles is capable of, I think you know what you know Boyan Bogdanovich is capable of, but you have no idea what you're going to get from Jordan Clarkson on a night in night out basis. You don't know what you're going to get from Rudy and Derek Favors. Um, I don't think at all that you want to or can count on a guy like George Niang. Yeah. You are reliant on Donovan Mitchell having a, an ankle that'll work and <laughs> and making three shot three ball. Yeah. I mean, he's got to shoot the three well where the Jazz aren't going to win because right now I think it's pretty clear the Jazz are hesitant to, you know, take the leash off and send him into the into the paint because that's where he continues to get hurt. Yeah, he has been roaming the perimeter. I, I would agree with that. I mean, yeah. there, are, there have been a few times where the play has dictated that he he gets into the paint and tries to work the floater game a little bit. But in terms of explosiveness and, like, you know, the way he usually plays, I, I do agree that he's definitely been trying to work the perimeter, play a lower contact style of game. So... Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. I mean, his ankle, it's so funny how how ankle injuries work. Like some guys, you know, like like the Kyrie ankle, right? Yes. Like he's not really even able to walk or even function. Whereas, you know, Don did this ankle. First, he did it in Indy. He comes back from that. Then he has the ankle, you know, he hits his ankle earlier in the series. And it's not even that he can't explode. It's like it just gets weak as the game wears on. It's like it just kind of runs out of gas. It's it's sort of a – it's like this weird thing where I'm assuming what happens is, is it swells up on him. He loses range of motion in his ankle, and it makes it really difficult for him to, to really do anything. So we'll see. We'll see. All I'm saying is – uh, the Kawhi light being out is a huge deal. That is a massive break for the Utah Jazz. Yeah, and there's some people reporting, you know, and, and I would be cautious with the information that's out there, but um, there's a lot of people, you know, saying that that the MRI came back with no structural damage, but there is definitely a quote-unquote issue with the knee. And, you know, that makes sense. I mean, you, you what that tells me is that Kawhi Leonard probably does not have, um, you know, any ligament damage in that knee. But what that tells me is that he's probably got a knee sprain. And there's some small tearing in in one of the ligaments, and, and you cannot risk that with Kawhi Leonard. Because yeah. if, if they're going to go on and win this series and go to the Western Conference Finals, they're going to need Kawhi Leonard. Yeah. And I think, by the way, not to continue to espouse about my awesomeness, <laughs> I think they they the level of confidence winning at at the Vivint is not high for the Clippers. Mm -hmm. I think they know they can win at Staples Center, and then they'll roll the dice in Game Seven. This feels like Kawhi Leonard hedging his bet and saying, "We've been here against the Mavericks. We can do this against the Jazz. Let's take a game off. Let's rest for four days, and yeah. then let's come back on. You know, let's come back on Friday and and." you know, get back to doing what we do in game six. That's what this feels like to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it very well could be. And and I, I can't say that I, um, 
for the Clippers, I can't say that I disagree because they are so reliant on, you know, on Kawhi and what he's able to do. You know, we were having the same conversation earlier in the show about the Brooklyn Nets and Reggie getting a lot of Reggie Miller getting a lot of criticism for saying that the Nets should sit out Kevin Durant and James Harden after what happened last night. And I disagreed with that. But, you know, for the Clippers, I mean, if that's the strategy they're going with, they're definitely playing with fire. I don't know that I'd be comfortable going with that strategy. But, you know, if they feel like it, they they yeah. definitely know they can win it at Staples Center. So with that in mind, you, you're, you're essentially putting yourself in a position where you're saying, okay, we're going to give you game five. We're, we're just going to give it to you. Take it. Do, do you. Great. You can have game five. But we're we're confident that we can win two in a row, and I think that's incredibly ballsy. But if that's what it comes down to, it's what it comes down to. And like I said on the show yesterday, when you give athletes of this caliber, of that skill ability, a mission and a very simple goal, it's funny how that works out in the end. So we'll see. Yeah, and I think as far as as the Jazz go, um, you know, there's two sides to this corn. I agree with uh, Red Heart Norvis, who says uh, it's kind of sad. Uh, if Kawhi is out, but we'll take it. Yeah, you uh, will. Yeah, you'd yeah. like to beat the best of the best with their best. But if you can't do that, you're happy to move on anyway. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I mean right? I <laughs> yeah. mean, you, you'd like to beat Kawhi and the Clippers, but if you got to beat PG and the Clippers, you're fine with that too. Um, and, you know, as far as adjustments go, um, mix like, what do you what do you guys think the Clippers will do? You know, I, I think it's pretty clear. I think Nick Batum plays a hell of a lot more minutes. Um, because he is one of their better defenders. And I think that you have to get a heck of a lot more out of Reggie Jackson. Yeah, um, Reggie's got to score 20 tonight, and I think he knows that. Um, I think if you're looking for guys off the bench, I think you're just going to see the guys who played a bunch of minutes, and that's you know Luke Kennard, um, Terrence Mann, certainly Patrick Beverly, uh, because Bev is a defensive guy. I think instead of 20 minutes, I think you're going to see Patrick Beverly play 25, 28 minutes. You think we get a little DeMarcus Cousins tonight, too? I, I think physicality? I think he's very much in the George Niang yeah. business. I right. just don't know how, how if Rudy Gobert is in the game, how does DeMarcus Cousins play? I mean, uh, sure, if you want to play him against Derek Favors, because I don't think Favors can guard him at the stripe, okay, I can see that. Yeah. But who are you going to take down to play DeMarcus Cousins? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is, Zubats. I don't know. I mean, it would be Zubats, I guess, but, but I, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, but Zubats has been playing very well against Derek Favors. He has. Yeah, he has. I, all, I'm, all I'm thinking of with the DeMarcus thing is that is that DeMarcus has this edge about him where he's more than happy to go in and try to kick your ass for 10 minutes, you know, in the paint. And, and yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, if I'm Ty Lue tonight, I'm like, all right, you know, maybe Boogie can be this sort of like, you know, wild card off off my bench where I can bring him in certain situations and try to get Rudy Gobert off of his game a little bit. You know, if I literally give him the simple mission of, hey, go in, be really physical with Rudy, pick up a couple fouls, and, you know, beat him up a little bit, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think at this point in Boogie's career, that could be that could be an interesting little little fold or or wrinkle to this game. So we'll see. I mean, again, with one, with one less guy on your, uh, you know, on your roster for tonight, you would think that everybody would just slot up one and, and maybe some guys get some extra minutes. Yeah, it certainly will be interesting to see what, what that looks like. And just looking at some of the, you know, some of the reactions to this, uh, people are absolutely writing off uh, the LA Clippers. And I, I, I wouldn't write off the Clippers. I still think Obviously, that's your best player. And to win a series without your best player is very difficult. Mm -hmm. The Jazz have not played very well the last two games. And I think a lot of that, as I said yesterday, was because they were on the road. I would expect them to play a heck of a lot better at home. Um, but I would not go riding off the Clippers in entirety. I think that this is still a dangerous team. Now they're a wounded dog, and I think we all know how vicious they can be. Um, I think that there is going to be... I think this game is going to be very physical is the right way to say it. I think now the Clippers know that they're going to have to attack the Jazz. And that means a lot more play in the paint. I think that means that Rudy Gobert has got to be disciplined because I think in the first quarter, you, you're going to know how the Clippers intend to play this game. And if that means coming out and attacking the basket, you're going to know that right off the break. Because they they get into the paint with ease. I mean, the Clippers have no problem. Yes, you know, like you're talking about your best on-ball defender in Royce O'Neal. Kawhi Leonard just walked right past him for that dunk the other night. 
They know that the Jazz cannot stop them from getting into the paint. The question is, what do the Clippers do when they get into the paint? Because I don't see this being some 25-point win for the Jazz. It'd be nice if you had a laugher. It'd be nice if you had yeah, just one that you could cruise in. That'd be I don't real think nice. that's going to be the case tonight. I think the Clippers are going to be a motivated bunch, and I think the L.A. Clippers are going to come out and give you every absolute last drop that they have left in the tank. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of feeding off of the, okay, now we're definitely underdogs, no Kawhi. Let's give it all we got. And I, and I think to that end, you can't let this series get to seven. I, I completely agree with you. You said that about five minutes ago. This series goes to a game seven. Um, that is definitely a slippery slope. <laughs> you yeah, don't want to be there. Well, I again, I will just maintain that tonight's a must win. And I know I've said that 10 times, but the reason it's a must win is because now with Chris Paul and COVID protocols and questions about whether he'll be available, win tonight. Close on Friday, open the Western Conference Finals on Sunday. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's the only thing that makes sense to me. And you know, if you are the the NBA and you still haven't released that Western Conference Finals schedule yet, because you don't know you're in a you're you're getting a pivotal Game Five. By the way, there's also that. Uh, this is Game Five of the the Clippers Jazz series. Whoever wins tonight probably wins the series. So. This is a huge game. This is a huge night. Yeah. This is listen. If, if you're if you're going to the game, you got to be loud and proud tonight. And there, by the way, I was really surprised to see the Jazz tweeting out that tickets were still available for the game tonight yesterday. Wow. I was surprised. That is by surprising. That. I was really surprised by that. I mean, I I think the Jazz need this fan base as much as they ever have because you have a lot of guys that are not right right now. Rudy Gobert is, has not played very well the last two games. Yeah. And he gets a lot of his swagger at home. I don't want to see Rudy complaining to the officials tonight. Yeah. I want to see Rudy with a 20 and 20 game. Yeah. That's seriously. what's required. Right? Seriously. I mean, yeah. that's what's required out of Rudy Gobert. End this series just as soon as you can end it. Yeah. Because now there's questions about the Suns and their ability to, to be full strength for game one of the Western Conference Finals.